only for asking for freedom, I was arrested. And I was tortured. I was 15 years old. Don't really understand the situation. In a prison, they tortured me, and my torture forced me to say that I have killed, I had weapons. But they didn't come that easy. He had to pull out my fingernails out of my fingers first before I give this false confession. I was only 15 years old when the guard opened scarred in my body. I was only 15 years old when my life experience became nearly too much to bear. I was only 15 years old when I wished to die. I remember one Tuesday. I already been in prison for three years and experienced all kind of torture and I was starving. But the guard opened the door and he said, Omar, the only time they say your name and say in prison is when they going to kill you. They took me from my room. They killed somebody who was next to me, asked me to pull him outside of the room. I pulled this body out. I looked at his face. It was my best friend at that time. The guards took me, isolated me in room for 48 hours, in every single hour, day and night. When the watch of the guard beep, he comes and asks me a question. How do you want me to kill you? Be creative. I was forced to give 68 answers instead for 48, because not all of them was nice or good enough for him to enjoy killing me. After 48 hours, they pulled me out of the room, took me in the car, blindfolded my eyes, my hands tied behind me, and they put me in the street facing the ground. The officer is walking slowly behind me, and I'm scared because I don't want to see how they're going to kill me. I don't know. He walks, talks about my death, then he just got silent. And load, aim, didn't go that quickly. It took a billion years for me to feel between load and aim. It takes so long time. Then he said, shoot, poof. And I died for the first time. I never died before. I didn't know how it feels or what's going to happen. H have any of you died before and can explain how it feels to die? I didn't, so I was just thinking, wow, finally to after life. I woke up still alive, didn't know what happened. The guy they killed in the room when they come to take me was a guy who was supposed to be released. They killed him. They put my name on his face and they took me outside of prison because it was my day to be executed. Took me outside of prison with his name because my mother paid $20,000 to an officer to get me out of prison. She didn't know how. But my mom wanted me to be alive after that they killed my father and my siblings in an attack on our village in Syria. But I mentioned just was the mental torture you experience by the Syrian regime. I didn't talk about the physical because it's not going to help you understand. Because the physical torture, you don't understand it if you don't experience it. You don't understand physical torture unless you experience it yourself. Omar was only 15 years old when he experienced that which cannot be communicated unless you experience it yourself. Maybe that's why so many of us Christians don't take the persecuted church very seriously. Maybe that's why we only remember it when it's brought to our attention. Maybe that's why we don't pray for those who are being persecuted because we have never experienced it ourselves. Therefore, we cannot feel what it is that they're feeling. It wasn't the UN subcommittee that got this young man his freedom, but it was the $20,000 bribe that his mother gave. Those who don't have access to that, to that amount of money, or those who can't afford such a high price for freedom, suffer the consequences. Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today, June the 26th, 2022, is International Day in support of victims of torture. 
It's not just the Christians that are being tortured, but political prisoners as well. Those who want nothing more than liberty, freedom, and the right to the pursuit of happiness, the right to freedom, the right to worship. Not just them, but random people are also picked up on the streets. Even right here in America, they're kidnapped for the purpose of being tortured as a source of entertainment for sick, deranged minds. Political prisoners are imprisoned, tortured, because they're seen as going against the state. They're going against their own governments just because they speak up on behalf of themselves and their fellow citizens. This happened to the prophet Jeremiah. So turn with me please to Jeremiah chapter 38 verse 1 through 6. Now Shephatiah the son of Matan, Gadaliah the son of Pashur, Jukal the son of Shalemiah, and Pashur the son of Malchiah heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hands of the enemy of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the officials said to, to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast them into a cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes, and there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank in the mud. Jeremiah, the prophet of the Lord, was only telling the people what the Lord, their God, had said. Words that would save their lives. Surrender to the Chaldeans and live. Resist and die. It was a choice of life or death. It was because of their rebellion and their idol worship that they were given into the hands of their enemy, the Babylonians. God had warned his people many, many times and by many, many prophets. Prophets that they killed and mistreated. Jeremiah himself was stoned to death. Isaiah was sawed in half. So the persecution of godly men bringing godly words, words of life to an ungrateful world is nothing new. Still, we do it. Still, they do it. And sometimes to their own peril. Every time you share the good news, you bring words of life. Although Jeremiah preached the words of life, the leaders who heard the words convinced the people that they were actually words of death. Why? Because those leaders, those people, they were pushing their own agenda. They were not looking out for the welfare of the people that they were supposed to represent, the people that they, they, they were supposed to protect. But they did it even to the hurt of those people that they were supposed to protect. Even today, our leaders are persuading the people that the Lord's words are words of death and not life. They convince the people that we who preach the good news mean it to their harm. They turn the very words of life into words of death. They convince the people that there is no God. And if there is a God, there's no need for him. They say that his words are burdensome. 
they're outdated, they're a torture. When the reality is their own souls are being tortured within them. And the leaders that they look to refuse to give them any relief. And they deny others who would bring them relief the opportunity to help. As I said today, the UN Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture is celebrating uh, or, or remembering those who are being tortured. But it was not the UN Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture that, that uh, got this young man's Mess that one up right there. The UN Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture is an arm of the United Nations. It's organized to prevent countries from torturing their prisoners. Yet, there are reports of our own CIA using torture to extract information from prisoners that they either arrested or have kidnapped. Not only that, but there is, is no evidence of countries, especially the communist countries, discontinuing the use of torture, even with that organization. Why am I talking about torture? Because today is the UN International Day in support of victims of torture. And we, as citizens of the world, walk around in complete ignorance of what is really going on in the world. So why am I talking about this? Maybe this letter from a political prisoner might help us understand the importance of talking about this. I write to you today as we approach the 10th anniversary of the uprising and the 9th anniversary of the last kiss I gave to my mother's hands. In 2012, I was told effectively by Syrian intelligence officials that I should remember the day I was detained as my new birthday and that they would make sure I would want to forget it. They marked the days on my feet, fingernails, and a month's worth of hands. How lucky I am it was only early March. Over the years, I've witnessed death more times than I can count, and I've seen it face to face. We became so familiar with each other but I always stayed sharp to remember the faces, the names, and the stories behind it to be able to tell it one day to my kids and to the world. In March of 2011, we had decided to break the chains we were born with and to tell those who enslaved us that we were made to be free and to tell the world and you who are reading my letter today that we belong to a world where we are not punished for thinking differently for demanding dignity and freedom, for wanting a responsible government, and for yearning to walk tall as every being on this earth is meant to. Since I was moved here four years ago, I was told by the new arrivals that the walls of silence around Syria have been destroyed. I heard about the children who were gassed by sarin in their sleep. I heard about the villages that were destroyed by barrel bombs. I heard about the millions who have thrown their children to the sea so they can get a merciful death better than the one we see here every day. And I heard about the images that you have all seen, the images of those who we cried over the years, the images of those who were luckier than us. So I wonder, as I quickly put this together, why do I write to you what, we, what you already know? Why do I write what you already know and what you have already heard? I wonder how many more need to die of torture and bombardment and of hopelessness. How many generations would need to continue to live in fear? I know you know the answer. Do not let us down. This is a letter from a Syrian political prisoner. In 2021, the U.S. pledged almost $600 million to Syria. And since 2011, the U.S. alone has sent as much as $7.7 .7 billion to Syria and aid. Yet, there is no demand for change. No demand that political prisoners be released. No demand that their torture be stopped. No demand for the freedom and the right to worship. But someone will say, 
Yeah, but Brother Kenny, this aids the people. I said, really? Really? I mean, do you really believe that a government who will inflict such atrocities on their own citizens would somehow mysteriously become laden with so much mercy that they would begin to treat those who the state deems as an enemy better just because they get free money? When in fact, it is not free money at all. The American taxpayers will have to pay that money back with interest. And we have no say whatsoever about it. Yet, we are responsible for it. We are responsible for paying it back. Well, Brother Kenny, I'm sure the only, that the only ones that they put in there are murderers, those who are a threat to society. Well, not according to first-hand witnesses, especially this one guy. He said that he was in a federal prison in Syria. And the people there were the nicest and the most helpful he had ever met in all of the world. So much so that he had to ask why that is. Why you're so helpful. Why you're so nice. And this was their response. Take a look. I was later reassigned to a large federal prison and kept with thousands of other Syrians. And these men were among some of the most welcoming and kind and overall remarkable people that I've ever met anywhere in the world. And I remember one evening mentioning to one of these men, I said, you know, everybody here is, is, is so nice to me, right? It was hard to know what to expect in, in a place like this. And he said, Sam, in Syria, all the good people are here in prison because all the bad people are outside and putting us in here. The federal prisoners stated that all of the bad people are on the outside, putting all of the good people on the inside in prison. That's why all of the people in there are good. They're, they're, they're helpful, they're nice. Not only are political prisoners being tortured, but our own brothers and sisters in Christ are being tortured because they have accepted the one true God, the only God that offers life. From the very beginning of the Christian faith, torture and persecution has stopped the Christian. At times, it was not so bad. At others, it was so rampant that the Christian had no relief they had to hide in caves. They had to hide underground. They went around in rags, hiding because of the persecution. You say that was years gone by. And it can't happen now. It can't happen in our civilized world. And if it does happen, it's very rare. Well, there are those who beg to differ. I want you to listen to this video. Christians here in Egypt are encouraged to know they're not alone. Back in the United States, there's a growing movement among Christians there to demonstrate unity and solidarity with those who are suffering for Christ in the Middle East. What we thought was, how could we identify and stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being brutalized around the world for their Christian faith. What tangible thing could we do? What practical thing could we do? Immediately, orange jumpsuits came to mind. Mahoney and others launched the hashtag orange jumpsuit campaign. The movement has expanded to orange scarves, sweaters, and ribbons. It's to remind our brothers and sisters that we love them and we're standing with them and to remind decision makers here in America and across the globe, the free nations of the world, we cannot be silent on this issue. Mahoney says the response has been amazing. Non-Christians have joined in as well. A Jewish rabbi to stand in solidarity with persecuted Christians is dyeing his beard orange, which I think is incredible, and I can't wait to see that. Miriam was encouraged after she viewed cell phone photos of Americans wearing orange. May the Lord make their love grow and grow. We are very happy with their love. We don't deserve their love. 
Mahoney says every five minutes around the world, a Christian is killed for his faith. People don't understand the kind of barbarism and brutality they are going through. And you know, when I visit persecuted Christians in the Middle East, there's one thing they always ask. It doesn't matter if it's Iraq, Syria, wherever it might be, it's this. Please remember us. And wearing orange on the job or at church helps people remember them. I think people need to understand that if we do not act quickly, the public expression of Christianity may be extinguished in the Middle East. As Elie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner says, we must always take sides. Silence only helps the oppressor, never the oppressed. Did you hear what he said? Every five minutes around the world, a Christian is killed. Or, or even better yet, every five minutes, a Christian is murdered because of his faith. Nothing more than his belief in Jesus. These Christians are tortured because they simply believe and accept Jesus and the salvation that he offers. All they want is the right to life and that life to be dedicated to Jesus. And it costs them their life. I want you to know that there's coming a time when we here in the free world, with all the freedom that we seem to be enjoying now, that freedom will be taken away from us. We will lose that according to Jesus' words. He described it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 through 13. Then they would deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many would fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus said that they will deliver us, who's us? Us Christians, those who believe in his name, those who call upon his name, they will deliver us up to tribulation and we will be hated by all nations. We will be, we will be hated by everyone. A time of extreme persecution will arise. Death for those who will not recant their allegiance to Jesus. Torture for those who hold out or who try to hold out. A time is coming and is now here, I believe, when good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Sin and debauchery will be celebrated. Vileness and shameful things will be lifted up and proclaimed as wholesome and good. Christians will be arrested and thrown into prison, all for the sake of the gospel, all for the sake of Jesus. They will be beaten and their property confiscated. They will be seen as the enemy of the state and their freedom will be revoked. So don't say or don't believe that that this can't happen to us here. Because what you see happening is only in a faraway country. The same way that those people went to the king to have Jeremiah incarcerated, these people will go to lawmakers right here in our time to create laws to hush up the word of God. They will convince them that our message is not for their good. And we are not seeking the welfare of this people, but we're seeking their harm. And those people will believe it. And they will create these laws to hush up the word of God, to take the right to life away from them. So don't take your religious freedom for granted. Because one day, it will be taken away from you. The International Day in support of victims of torture. Today, let us remember 
those who are being tortured, those who are being persecuted, those who, who, who are imprisoned. Let us not just remember them, but let us give them a voice. Let us speak up for them. Let us show our support by wearing orange or an orange ribbon. Let us make our representatives know that we care about tortured victims around the world, especially our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And if you are a victim of torture, there is healing in Jesus because there is hope in Jesus. Let me leave you with this message. Miriam also has a message for others who have suffered or still face danger from ISIS. Don't be sad or cry. God will support us all. He will fulfill his promise that he is the father of the orphans and the widows. Those are the words of a persecuted Christian, not someone who heard about persecution, not someone who merely read about persecution, but a woman who have lived it and is still living it. She found out about the execution of her husband because he was a Christian when she saw him on a video that went viral. Those times are here. Believe me, they're coming also to the West. They're coming to the free world. So here's the thing, now is the time, now is the acceptable time to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So it's gonna be taken away from us. So if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you wanna take this opportunity, because it might be your last opportunity to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, all you gotta do is to say this simple prayer with me and believe it with your heart. I mean, think about it. There must be something to this Jesus if the whole world is trying to keep you from Him and Him from you. So if you want to know Him, say this prayer with me and mean it with your heart. Father, forgive me of my sins. I accept the free gift of life that Jesus offered, that he purchased on Calvary with his own blood. I thank you for this opportunity, and I gladly accept it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a simple prayer. A prayer accepting the forgiveness of Jesus. Accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you said that prayer, if you believed it, you are now a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You're a new creation. I want you, I want to leave you with this, that Jesus loves you. He died for you. He loves you, sincerely loves you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.